This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Stick around to the end of the video for a special deal they're offering through my channel. Okay, listen up. This is a terrific video game and you should buy it. Remnant from the Ashes from Gunfire Games is a game that's both easy and difficult to describe. Easy because it borrows from so many genres and you can list easy touch points like if Dark Souls and Warframe and The Division had a baby, but difficult because when you shorthand the explanation like that, you aren't fully communicating just how unique and fun Remnant feels and how much this game stands wholly apart from pretty much anything that's come before it. Most good innovation is about taking two or three things that work and smacking them together to form something new but that isn't as easy to pull off as it sounds. Gunfire didn't just copy and paste a whole bunch of ideas from other games, putting them in a blender and hoping for the best. They took the time to really understand what makes for good shooting mechanics and asked, how do we bring those in? What makes a difficulty curve compelling and how do we bring parts of that in? What makes for good procedurally generated levels and how do we avoid the common pitfall of space becoming repetitive and meaningless? What makes for interesting encounter design and how do we make that work in an action RPG third person shooter. You can tell that the work that's gone into this product could have only come from people who really understood each of these components and had the technical and artistic capability to deliver a fantastic rendition of each of them within this game. On top of all of that, there's just a very clear vision on display. You can tell the dev team could really see in their minds what type of game they wanted to create and they just focused on that. Remnant isn't bloated with heaps of bullshit that doesn't add value to the core experience. The result is a package that feels really lean and focused in the best possible way. It just feels like it has limited horizons, but the few things that Remnant sets out to achieve, it achieves handsomely. Anyway, look, I loved this game. I think it's great. So let me break down why I think that's the case so you can decide for yourself if this might be for you. Okay, so this is the most fun part of the review, trying to explain what the fuck Remnant from the Ashes actually is. Now, if you've heard anything about it, you've probably heard one of two things. Number one, it's like Dark Souls with guns, or number two, it's a looter shooter. Now, one of these things is kind of right, the other one is completely wrong. When you begin playing Remnant, it isn't immediately apparent to you what type of game it is. You'll create a character through their fairly impressive character customization tool, and then you'll be thrust into a cutscene that sets the scene for the journey ahead. You must reach the tower, learn what became of our warrior, face what lurks within. You'll wake on a beach where you'll roll through the game's tutorial area before you'll eventually arrive at Ward 13, the last bastion of humanity in the sea of corruption that is the outside world. It's peppered with your usual host of NPCs, some of whom exist purely to deliver dialogue, others who will sell you supplies and gear. You'll get to know the crew there, and then you'll turn on the power down in the basement before being asked to choose a class. There's three options, and they basically break down into short, medium, or long-range fighters. At this point, you might be thinking that this class choice is quite static or binary, like you're locked into it for the duration of the game, and that you won't be able to access certain abilities or armor types based on what you've chosen. But no, this is very similar to something like Dark Souls, where your initial choice gives you a set of stats and gear that gives you a boost in a certain direction, but you can build however you want after that based upon the weapons and armor that you equip and the stat trait points you invest in. This is a very freeform RPG progression system and we'll come back to that later on. Anyway, after selecting your class, you're pushed from the nest and told to explore the outside world because reasons. When you step out into the world, the nature of Remnant starts to make a little more sense. You start exploring the post-apocalyptic city streets and eventually you'll come to one of these glowing doors. These denote a dungeon space which you'll need to clear out to either collect an item or to eventually fight a boss. There are checkpoints at the start of these dungeons which act as sort of bonfires a la Dark Souls. They'll refill your Estus Flask, here called the Dragonheart, and they'll repopulate any enemies in the dungeon you might have already cleared. Anyway, you'll make your way through the dungeon, doing the thing, fighting the boss, and then you'll make your way back out to the overworld city streets to continue looking for new paths forward, new dungeons, new bosses, etc, etc. So that's ultimately the structure of Remnant. A lot of people are calling it Dark Souls with guns, and that's kind of right because, hey, 
you have an Estus flask and bonfires and when you kill bosses they drop an item that you can use to craft a weapon and the weapon upgrading system is the same and blah 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 and on it goes. There are a lot of borrowed systems that make it feel very Souls-like but there's also tons of other stuff that Souls games don't do, at least not quite in the same way. The biggest difference is the procedurally generated nature of each space. The overworld spaces connecting the dungeons are actually a mix of static tiles and procedural generation. So what I see here here is going to be similar but different to what you experience when you play the game. The dungeons themselves are all procedurally generated and that includes the enemies within them. When I enter a space the tile set is generated randomly and the location of enemies changes up every time I die in that dungeon. So if I'm going through and finding it really tricky and I die, the moment I respawn the enemies could have all been moved around or certain enemies won't appear or new ones will appear etc etc. This procedural generation extends even further, certain bosses may or may not appear for you on a certain playthrough. Certain quests may or may not appear. Certain items may appear in one area at one time and the next playthrough they may appear in a different area. Certain puzzles might appear for you or not. Obviously Bloodborne utilized a form of procedural generation in its chalice dungeons but that was a specific game mode separate from the main game. Remnant goes way way beyond that by building the entire game around this randomly procedurally generated structure making it much closer to something like Diablo. Just like Diablo, there's a story in Remnant and the player will be guided towards those story beats so you won't miss any of them, but what happens between those story beats is very different for each player and different on every playthrough. As for all the looter shooter labels that have been applied to it, that's no, just no. That's just wrong. Like there's there's nothing like Borderlands or Destiny or Anthem because enemies do not drop any actual weapons or armor and there isn't this focus on this endless gear grind. It's very much like Dark Souls. Find weapons and armor hidden throughout the world, kill bosses to, you know, get items you can use to craft new weapons, scavenge upgrade materials that enable you to make your equipment more powerful. Honestly, if you've played Souls-like, you know exactly how this progression system works and it's anything but a loot shooter. So that's what Remnant is at its core. It's a third person action RPG shooter built on procedural generation with lots of souls-like elements injected into the mix. Hopefully I've explained what it is, now let me explain why it's good. So I'm going to talk about the guts of the game now, and just to be super clear, the thesis I'm putting forward in this section is that this game works extremely well because it has a relentless commitment to creating an accessible level of difficulty and arming the player with every single tool they'll need to overcome challenges in a way that makes them feel like a proper badass. I'm going to explain more, but just remember, accessible difficulty feel like a badass. Let's start from the beginning. If you choose to pick up this game, I think the first thing you're going to gravitate towards is the robustness of the controls, the animation, and the overall combat loop. They're all excellent. Controls first. It just feels good to control your character. They have this perfect sort of weight to them and they respond snappily and the roll animation is great and when you vault over obstacles it looks awesome and your melee animations have this great hit registration. All of it, the whole package just controls beautifully and is so well animated. You never face moments where you wanted your character to do a thing and it just didn't do it that way. It's a, the relationship between player and character is seamless at all times. One of the biggest things that contributes to this overall feeling of responsiveness and fluidity is the way the game handles iframes. Now, if anyone isn't familiar with what these are, iframes are invulnerability frames and they're triggered when you perform certain actions like a dodge roll. The intent is to time your roll so that you execute it at the exact moment that you're about to get hit so that an attack that would have damaged you is instead completely avoided. Gunfire copped a lot of flack for the way they implemented iframes in Darksiders 3, where the implementation felt quite tight and a little bit inconsistent at times. I actually spoke to the game's principal designer about this since he was in my Twitch chat at one point and he told me there's a baseline nine iframes available on a roll compared to something like six frames in Monster Hunter World and you can actually extend the number of frames that you have in Remnant by another three if you wear a specific item. You can absolutely feel how generous these iframes are here and it really stands in stark contrast to stuff like Sekiro where stuff like the parry window is tuned much tighter. One theme I'll continue to come back to in this review is that the difficulty curve in this game is fantastic fantastic for casual players who are looking for a challenge. Hardcore purists might find this too easy, but the game isn't trying to break you like Sekiro is. 
It's trying to let you have fun while also being challenging, and the generous iframes give the player the chance to feel skillful without demanding too much of them. Sticking with this whole iframe thing for a moment longer, because I think it's actually really important to sort of understand the fundamental design philosophy of the game. Enemies are designed in such a way where you can intuit their attack timings rather than having to learn them through dying or having to memorize a variety of complex attack animations. So again, in Sekiro, many enemies and bosses are designed in such a way as to bait out your iframes. They have all these wind up animations that they'll hold for just a second longer than you expect them to. Or when they jump, they sort of hang in the air unnaturally for just a moment more than gravity would allow. And these inconsistent timings made it impossible to meet new enemies in the field and immediately overcome them. You had to learn all of their very specific timing quirks through a process of failing to them. Remnant is the exact opposite of this. Every enemy's attacks are clearly telegraphed and there's no funky business with them holding their attacks for for some mystery period of time so that you end up dying to them the first time you meet them. No, it's all super clear here. It's super consistent, which means that you can meet new foes on the field and immediately start outplaying them. That makes it objectively easier than something like Sekiro and hence more accessible to those looking to jump in and have fun, feeling pretty badass and in control as they do it. Sound design in Remnant is also in line with this philosophy. First of all, it's excellent with a huge range of really unique meaty sounds that just create a brilliant soundscape. But it's positional audio and audio telegraphs that really stand out here. You can absolutely tell where every single enemy is on the map at any point in time simply by listening out for them. One enemy early on in the game teleports around the map and as soon as he teleports I immediately know where he's gone because I can hear it well before I can see it and I can snap to that position and immediately start firing. Footsteps in this game are so loud because the developer wants you to know where enemies are patrolling so you aren't ever surprised by them. Tons of enemies also have very clear audio telegraphs. These exploding gas jerk dudes will sort of wheeze as they run up to you and you can actually judge their proximity by that sound alone. These javelin throwing enemies will prime their weapon just before they throw it so you know it's coming. These butterfly bosses will prime their weapons with a sound effect as well, particularly important since you're fighting two of them at once and you literally cannot see when one of them is about to swing at you. You can time your dodge roll based on the sound alone in this encounter because the sound design has made that possible and I think that's awesome. Weapon mechanics are designed in a very similar way. First of all, weapons feel great to fire. They tick all the right boxes in terms of sound and feedback and responsiveness. The range of them is also really impressive, particularly the boss weapons that you can craft after you've killed the boss. This is a sort of hand cannon shotgun with an alternate fire mode that fires six slugs that bounce off walls if they miss targets. This one will teleport enemies into another dimension for a few seconds and when they come back they take 50% more damage. This one fires electricity bolts that have a chance to stun the target. There aren't a huge amount of weapons available but what's on offer is all handcrafted, unique, fun to use and brings a lot to whatever build you choose to run with. But notice the weapon targeting circle. See how it has this like big ass circle instead of a specific crosshair? This is genius because it forces the player to just put the circle over the target and pull the trigger. The player literally can't overthink things by worrying about where exactly the targeting reticle is because there is none. Some weapons like the sniper rifle do have this if you aim down sights, but the majority of weapons are designed to just get you firing rapidly in the general vicinity of the target rather than worrying too much about landing consistent precision damage. Again, some people are going to find this lack of precision frustrating, but I think most people will just enjoy themselves because you're spending more time shooting and less time aiming. I think that on the surface, it's really easy to look at Remnant and think, yeah, it's Dark Souls with guns. And I've already spoken about how this isn't the case structurally with things like procedural generation and dungeons, but there's a far starker contrast to be drawn here between the two. 
Dark Souls and Souls-like games, at their core, they're exercises in disarming the player and reducing their power. It's about making the player feel weak, such that when they overcome the challenges before them, there's a huge amount of satisfaction to be had in those moments. It's purposefully trying to obscure enemy behavior, such that the only way to learn about it is to die from it. Remnant is the exact opposite of this. At every turn, Remnant aims to empower the player. There are no jump scares, no silent enemies, no tricksy animations, no demands that you be perfect. All of it is just laid out before you so that you can see and hear it all clearly so that when you do meet new challenges, you're equipped to be able to face them immediately. And as a result, you're always feeling strong and in control. And the fact that Gunfire could accomplish this feeling of power while still making the game feel quite challenging is a pretty big deal. So how did they get that balance right? Now, I don't want to give you the impression that Remnant is easy, far from it. This is a challenging game and one you can make even more challenging depending on how you play it. The most basic choice is difficulty, where it offers normal, hard or nightmare mode. And once you select that difficulty, you're locked into it until you complete that playthrough or start a new game. The second choice you're going to have to make is whether to play solo or in a group of up to three people. You can, of course, invite your friends or you can simply match make into a group and play with others. Do note, though, that there's no means of communicating communicating with other players when you're on PC, no voice chat or text. This is a bit of a problem given the fact that some of the boss fights really benefit from being able to coordinate with another person, but other games got by fine without it, so yeah, look, it's not really the end of the world, but I know this will frustrate some players. I'm sure a lot of you out there are wondering if this game holds up as a solo experience, or is it worth your time if you don't have friends to play with? I'm going to say the answer to that question really depends on how hard you want this experience to be, because Playing solo makes this a vastly more difficult experience in almost every way. I say almost because there's one very important consideration to keep in mind when playing in groups, and that's the way scaling works. One person hosts the game and up to two others can join. Levels are procedurally generated at one level higher than the host's current level. So if you clear a space at level 30 and then you zone into the next area, it will be populated at level 31. This ensures that the game remains consistent consistently challenging and you can't just over level stuff by grinding out experience. The problem with this though is that your party members aren't automatically scaled to the level of the host's game. So if I'm level 30 and my friend is level 10 and he joins my game, my friend is going to be doing almost no damage while getting like one shot by pretty much everything. While this is happening, enemies have vastly more HP to compensate for the added number of players. To top all of this off, only the host's story progression is saved. So if you join a friend's campaign and do 10 hours of progress, you're going to have to do all that all over again when you load into your next solo game. Look, in short, the way that co-op has been implemented here has some serious problems. It didn't ruin the experience for me because I was playing with people at the same level as myself and I was always hosting, but your mileage may significantly vary. This is definitely a case of buyer be warned. Anyway, that's all the shitty stuff about co-op and how under certain conditions it can make the game way harder and way more annoying. Outside of this, playing co-op absolutely makes the game way, way easier. I mean, just as an example, dungeons. One of the main difficulty mechanisms that this game uses are these long drawn out dungeons full of enemies. There's no boss to fight here, but you clear through these spaces on your way to a boss. There's no checkpoints throughout them and some of them can have upwards of like 50 or 60 or 70 enemies, just a lot of enemies and you're moving through these spaces and you're slowly using up all of your healing flasks and you're running low on ammo and eventually you just get overwhelmed and boom, down you go. You now need to restart the entire dungeon and re-clear it. If you were playing in a group, someone in your party would have just been able to res you up straight away and you'd be able to keep going, no problem. When you're playing solo, no, you have to redo the whole thing. Bosses as well are way more difficult when you're playing solo because they're fixated on you the entire time, where being in a group means that while one person has the boss's attention, the other person can get behind them and hit them in their weak spot. Build diversity also plays a really big factor in mitigating difficulty. One person can bring a healing rift that heals the group. The other person can drop a totem that distracts enemies. The other one can wear heavy armor and charge in with, you know, a melee damage reduction cooldown while your long range buddy sits at the very back with 300% bonus weak point damage taking pot shots at everyone. The more tools you're able to bring to the fight, the easier it gets. So obviously group play helps take the edge off this in a big way. I will say though that the game is still extremely playable solo 
solo, and I found it really enjoyable too. I played about a third of the game solo, and I was really struck by the fact that it became like a completely different experience, but it all still hung together really well. In groups, the game feels much more like Warframe or Left 4 Dead, with hordes of enemies screaming towards you and you frantically yelling things at your teammates to try and keep up. It feels like an action game in those moments. But solo, you just can't charge in there like that. You have to play smarter, you have to play safer. You'll want to use your sniper rifle more often to clear out spaces, having a versatile close range weapon ready for when things get personal. When playing alone, this game feels almost like a survival horror game, like playing Resident Evil 2, only with slightly more ammo. It was while I was playing solo that I really began to notice one of the game's biggest strengths, the incredible enemy AI. A lot of the difficulty you'll encounter when playing through Remnant is the fact that the enemies are far more clever than you'd expect from a game like this. Some of them will run up in a straight line towards you with very easy to dodge attacks, but some of them will scurry from cover to cover. They'll occupy high ground, popping out to dish out damage before ducking back down to reload. They'll flank aggressively and they'll push their advantage when they have the numbers. Often, high HP mini bosses will soak up your attention while smaller enemies will take the opportunity to sneak around you and begin, you know, taking pot shots at you. This isn't always the case, of course. Certainly, at some points in the game, they're purposefully giving you a bit of a break and a bit of a chance to breathe. But when the game wants things to feel oppressive, the AI absolutely delivers. I guess the last component of the difficulty curve is boss encounter design, and here I have to say that it's a real mixed bag. So anyone who's played any Souls-like before will know that there's a fair amount of range in boss difficulty, some of them being cakewalks and some of them being infuriatingly challenging. And it's just like that here in Remnant, only it feels like the range is much wider and it tends towards the easier end of the spectrum. None of the bosses are even close to some of the more challenging encounters you'll find in something like Sekiro, while a huge portion of them feels so easy you'll honestly wonder if they bugged out. Funny story, I did this encounter with one of the developers in the stream and when I was done he said, huh, that's funny, there was meant to be two bosses during that encounter. One of them had completely bugged out and just not appeared, so lucky me I guess? At the core of most boss design is a high HP enemy with a very specific moveset that's it's quite straightforward and easy to get to grips with. Where the difficulty is ratcheted up is through the use of adds or smaller enemies that spawn during the encounter. Some people are going to find this frustrating and repetitive. Personally, I think it's fine because this is ultimately a shooter and if you don't have adds bum rushing you on the reg, you're just going to be able to sit back and just snipe the boss from, you know, the back of the area and the boss can't do anything and that's it. You need those adds to keep Keep pressure on you so you don't settle into cheesy gameplay patterns so i think that gunfire have done a really good job here at the start of this review i said there was a very clear vision running through this game i think the backbone of this vision is the fact that this is a game that's meant to be played through many times starting new games with your friends playing through parts of it solo re-rolling your world when you're done and doing it all over again trying different builds trying different combination of perks and stats and weapons and whatever else it's meant to be done again and again and again there's structural motivators to this we've already spoken about the fact that you can't get every boss every weapon and every quest on a single playthrough you need to play through multiple times in order to accomplish everything and you're either going to love or hate that depending on what you're looking to get when you purchase this game there's also a strong rpg motivator behind this replayability as well in that there are dozens of traits to unlock and each of them can be maxed out to level 20. There's a very long progression horizon to work towards and it's intended that you work towards that slowly over the course of multiple playthroughs. If you're going to dislike Remnant, it's probably going to be because it isn't offering you the sort of curated experience you might be hoping for when you heard it was Dark Souls with guns. Remnant isn't trying to be Dark Souls, it's just borrowing parts of it to incorporate into its own unique arcade style formula. This is far more an ARPG akin to Diablo or Warframe than it is a Souls-like, and if you go into it with the expectation that you will play it repeatedly, you're going to have an easier time accepting the simplified difficulty curve, its inconsistent boss design, and its more repetitive elements. You might also struggle with some bugs. Now, full disclosure, I definitely had some bugs throughout my playthrough, like the boss that bugged out when the dev was in the chat, and another boss that just like completely disappeared. He just, just, just peaced out, he was gone, and then that was it, like the boss wasn't there. Uh, enemies will sometimes stand there and do nothing. Um, there's, there's, there's lots of bugs, right? There's, there's definitely bugs. And many other people have highlighted really serious bugs as well that can kind of be, you know, game breaking, as well as major performance issues on different graphics cards and on consoles. 
If you are someone that demands a bug-free experience, I would hold off on this game for a few weeks or a few months because the developers are pushing out very regular patches and it will hopefully be in better shape later on. For me personally, even though I had bugs, none of them affected my enjoyment of the game in the slightest. Despite the bugs, I really wanna call out just how consumer friendly this product is. It's 40 US dollars for at least 15 hours of gameplay on your first playthrough and many, many more hours after that, depending on how much you enjoy it. There's there's no microtransactions whatsoever and the developer has said that there's a mix of free and paid DLC coming with things like an adventure mode allowing you to play through specific parts of the game without needing to restart your playthrough as well as new areas, new bosses, new weapons and more. Even with the bugs, this is a very complete product that is fantastic value for money at $40. And unfortunately, that's just all too rare these days. So that's Remnant from the Ashes. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. It's one of the biggest and best surprises of the year for me. And I'm so happy for Gunfire Games who clearly put a lot of work into developing a new IP, which is really risky. And I think they nailed it. At the same time, this game is not without its problems and not everyone likes it. If you're looking for a more scathing review, something to really show the flip side, I'd recommend checking out Jim Sterling's review, which I'll link in the description below. Now, I really disagree with pretty much everything Jim says here, but that's why I'm linking it to you so you can get a balanced look and decide for yourself if this is a game that's worth your time. I think it is. I think it's great. I hope you give it a shot because I think you'll be pleasantly surprised if you do. You know what else you should give a shot? Squarespace. Squarespace enables you to create professional looking websites using tools that are extremely simple to use. We're talking drag and drop templates that you can begin using in just minutes and that produce results that look super professional. You can also get analytics like traffic overview and you can add stuff like a comment section so you can begin building a community around your passion, your hobby, your business or whatever it is. Click the link in the description below to get started and receive a 10% discount on your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video and thank you for watching it.